Hello there, it's Jack here, Bakery Jack HQ, and a question I get asked all the time is what is the best way to store my homemade bread? Now, here's a loaf. I didn't make this one, I got it from the lovely people at Hungry Guest in Petworth. Thank you very much. Uh, I've taken off what I needed, and I'm going to keep it cut side down into the cupboard. This is my bread cupboard here, see? Keep it cut side down, retain all the moisture in the crumb, on the shelf like that. Outside should stay nice and crusty, next to the butter for emergencies, and I close the door like this, and I keep it in there real nice. If you have one of those bread bins, uh, a wooden one or a tin one with a loose lid, absolutely fine, it's exactly the same principle. Try and avoid cling film, try and avoid sealing up in a plastic box, because everything evens out, and you lose the crispy crustiness, it all goes a bit chewy and soft. For a standard loaf of bread, normal white or brown loaf of bread that I teach in my courses. Day one, day two, day three, a push is perfect for sandwiches. Day four, five, six, amazing toast, even day seven toast, even day eight toast sometimes. Um, after that, we're talking bread and butter pudding, croutons, breadcrumbs, all the other good stuff that comes from homemade bread. That's where mine lives. Uh, it's not gonna stay there for long though, believe me, but that's where it lives for now. If you've got a bread making question of your own, direct it to the comments box underneath and I'll do my best to get around to it in the next bread Q&A video. Hello there, it's Jack here at Bake With Jack headquarters and a question I get asked all the time is what is the best way to store my homemade bread? Now, oh, I left it in there. Uh. Hello there, it's Jack here answering your bread making questions at Bake With Jack Secret Headquarters. Uh, I've got a question here that I'm going to answer next week. It's from Tiny on Facebook and it says, how can you tell when your dough has proved for the right amount of time? I'm going to answer that one next week. For now, I want to talk to you about yeast. Now, there are three different types of yeast you can get. Okay, I'm going to briefly go through each one, uh, which one I like the best, uh, what they're doing, what they're for. Yeast makes bubbles in your dough. It is solely responsible for puffing your dough up. Dough puffs up, and then we bake it, and then when it comes out, we've got a nice, aerated, light bread. And that is the aim. That's what the yeast does for us. Yeast type number one is fresh yeast. It looks like this. It comes in a cube, right, like this. They have it at Sainsbury's on the bakery counter, still waiting for your call Sainsbury's. They have it at Sainsbury's on the bakery counter. Go and ask the man or the lady working there. They'll go and cut you off a piece, whatever you like. 50 grams, 100 grams, 200 grams, whatever you need. They'll go and cut it off. Uh, it lasts for ages. I keep it in a plastic box like this. I've lined it with baking parchment paper. I put the yeast on top. Another slice of paper on the top like this. A bit crunchy. And the lid goes on the top like that. Now, keep that in your fridge. Not too close to the back because it might freeze. The point of the paper is, yeast is a living, breathing thing, okay? It's huffing and puffing inside of this box. If it steams up, creates condensation, it's all gonna rain down on the top, turn it into a big puddle, which is what you don't want. Paper will protect it inside of the box and keep it nice. As long as you keep it nicely, keep it in the fridge for four weeks, easy. The main thing is with fresh yeast, is that it tells you when it's getting older. When you get it, it's real nice and fresh, it's a little bit crumbly, and as it gets older, it might go a little bit plasticine. You might lose that fresh smell. It might develop a whole new smell that doesn't smell very pleasant. It might really dry up. Either way, it's giving you signals that it's getting older, and you can keep using it if you want to, and pop a little bit extra in if you're a little bit worried. And when you finish risking it, throw it away and get a new one. Okay, the next two types of yeast I wanna talk about are dry. There's two dry varieties of yeast you can buy. Now, the first one is granules. It comes in a little tin that looks like this, but it is yellow. It's little tiny granules, they look like little beads almost, uh, and you must dissolve it in the water before you continue. Otherwise, you get flat bread with little tiny beads of crunchy yeast in it, and that's not to my personal taste. The second type of dry yeast you can buy actually is this one. It comes in a green tin, it's called Easy Bake Yeast and uh, you can buy it in a tin like this and just take out what you need, or you can buy it like this in a little seven gram packet. Either way, just put it straight into the flour, no need to dissolve it, put it into the flour and it does its business, whatever it needs to do. Whenever you're using dry yeast, and this applies to both, if the recipe says fresh yeast, always half it 
for dry, for example. 20 grams of fresh yeast, just use 10 grams of dry, it will be plenty. The issue I have with fresh yeast is it gives you no signals. There's no clue whether it's getting old or not, okay? If you have a tin like this and start using it out of it, you've opened it up, it will last for a certain amount of time. I don't know what it says on the back here. Four months. Uh, it will stop working. It will, there will be a point where it stops working, but it won't give you any signals. It will look the same, it will smell the same. The only signal I'll give you is when your bread doesn't rise, and now it's time to make tortilla wraps. I always use fresh yeast uh, because I like it. I shop at Sainsbury's anyway, uh, so I can pick it up every week if I need to, and if I don't, I just keep it in the fridge and it keeps really nice anyway. It almost makes the dry one a little bit redundant for me. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me yakking on about the different types of yeast. If you did, click like, click subscribe, and you won't miss a thing. Next week, I'm going to answer Tanya's question about when your dough has proved enough to be able to bake it. And um, if you've got a question of your own, Pop it in the comments box underneath and I will get around to answering it very, very soon. Thank you for watching. See you soon. Hello there, it's Jack here answering your bread making questions at Bake With Jack. Last week I had a question coming from Tanya on Facebook and it said, how can I tell when my dough has proved for the right amount of time? Now, this is a tricky one. You ready? Okay, bad news first. Bear with me. There is no hard and fast rule I can give you to let you know when your bread is ready to go into the oven. For example, I can't say let it rest for 57 minutes and it's ready to go in. I can't say leave it till it's two centimeters from the top of the tin and it's ready to go in. All this stuff is nonsense because if you read that in a book, for example, whoever wrote the book doesn't know what temperature your water was, what temperature your dough is, what temperature the room is, how humid it is today. Um, there are many, many factors. How fresh your yeast is, how accurately you weighed it in the first place. All these factors contribute to the speed of the rise of your dough. All you need to do is develop a feeling for it. And I'm so conscious in my courses that this can come across as being very, very vague. But you need to develop a feeling for it and that, to a certain extent, comes from experience. So when your dough rests, yeast makes bubbles inside and aerates it. It puffs it up. Dough starts off here, it's firm and it's bouncy. Have a feel of it at that point. Over time, it becomes softer and more aerated until there becomes a point where there's too much gas for the structure of the dough to hold and then it all collapses. Do not be afraid of that point because fortunately for us, there's a massive window of time where we can bake that loaf and it'd be absolutely wonderful and delicious for toast, for sandwiches, whatever you want to do. The point where you land inside of that window depends upon experience and how much risk you're willing to take. Here's a loaf of bread that I made earlier and here's my top tips for you to figure out at home when is the best time for you to put it into the oven. It will always be different from me to you because of the various uh, things that I mentioned earlier about temperature, about time, about yeast and all that other stuff. Also, the size of it also depends upon which flour you're using. They're all completely different. And also um, how well you worked it in the first place, how long you needed it for and developed that gluten. Because if it's underdeveloped, it's not going to get as big as what one will if it is nicely developed. Top tip number one. Use your eyes, okay? When you take the cloth off of your loaf of bread to have a look at it, if it has clearly risen, like this one has, this one was probably about there when it went into the tin at its highest point. If it has clearly risen, bake it. It will be absolutely fine. Whether or not you could have gone a little bit further into the danger zone, you won't know about that. And when you're eating nice, fresh, delicious, crunchy toast, you won't care about it anyway. Okay, top tip number two, use your sense of touch. Feel it, feel it when it went into the tin and feel the resistance to your finger. It would have been firm and bouncy. If a recipe says leave it for 60 minutes till it's double in size, ignore it. Set a timer for 30 minutes, come back, have another little feel and it will be softer, a little bit more delicate. Then decide whether you wanna go on. The longer you go on, the more delicate it becomes, and there's a point where you're thinking, oh my goodness, that's getting well soft and wobbly. Carefully put it into the oven. Carefully onto the shelf. Don't hit it down onto the shelf, because then you're gonna lose it. Put it into the shelf. 
If you think it's too delicate, get it in there quick, but try not to get that far. Have a little feel, have a feel and decide if you want to take a little bit more risk. It's cool. Go on if you want to. Okay, top tip number three for home bakers who really want to get involved in finding out when that sweet spot is to bake your bread. This is what you can do. Why not make two loaves or 12 rolls, split them onto three trays, four on a tray, right? Then you've got three different batches of bread to bake at different intervals if you want to. Leave the first one for a bit, use your eyes, use your sense of touch and decide whether you want to bake it. Bake the first batch, gone. Then wait a little bit longer, 10, 15 minutes, check the next batch, same thing, eyes, fingers, see what's going on, bake it. And then the third one. And remember at which point you bake the bread for the best result, and more importantly, which one you liked the best when it came out, which one you enjoyed eating the most, and which one you're gonna enjoy sharing with your friends and sharing with your family, because that's what homemade bread is all about. I hope you've learned something from this video, and I hope I've given you enough information for you to be able to bake at home and decide when that point is right for you to bake your bread. There is no quick fix on this one, I'm afraid, because there's so many variables contributing to what your dough does and how long it takes to do it. The only way I can give you more information and more help with this is if I come and bake with you. Now, this is something that I do do, and you can have a look at the website, it's bakewithjack.co.uk, I can come and break, bake and host a course in your own home. If you like this video, please click like, click subscribe and you won't miss a thing. Next week I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna show you in fact, because we're on video, how to shape a loaf of bread and I look forward to seeing you then. Hello, there's Jack here answering your bread making questions at Bake With Jack. Today I'm gonna show you how to shape a loaf of bread. There are loads of different ways to do it, but they always build tension across the top, key point. Always build tension across the top of the dough. If you build the tension that way, it'll puff up nice and proud instead of going ah, a little bit skew with all over the place. Always build tension across the top. This is the way I do it at home, and this is the way I teach on my courses. Have a look, let me know how you get on. Okay, so I made my dough earlier. I popped it into a bowl with a cloth on the top, and it's been sitting resting at room temperature somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes, which is fine. Now when I take the top off, I can see it's clearly risen. A lot of recipes say leave it until it's doubled in size. However, I'm not too worried about that. Just so we can, it's noticeably bigger than what it was. It's absolutely fine. We're ready to go for the next stage. Now, I'm gonna take it out of the bowl now. I'll pick it up by the edge like this and let it dangle. Now with my plastic scraper, I'm just gonna help it out, ease it out, round the edges, let it come out naturally. I want it to come out upside down onto the table. A little touch of flour like this. Upside down onto the table. Like that. Now the next thing I like to do is a little pre-shape. I like to tighten it up. A lot of people knock it down here with their fists and things like that, but I just like to tighten up a little touch by giving it a nice little fold. And this is what I do, okay? I wanna keep it round. It came out of the bowl round. It comes out like a circle. I'm just gonna give it a little press like this just to make it easy for myself. And take the side furthest away from me here. I'm gonna pick it up with my thumb and fingers like this. Give it a little stretch, nothing major, and bring it over towards me like that. Now, stick it down just shy of the edge. Give it a 90 degree turn like this and do the same again. 90 degree turn and the same again. Always taking that piece furthest away from you and bringing it over. Every time you do it, you'll notice there's another little bit sticking out. That's the next piece to take. Turn it around, take that piece, bring it in. Turn it around, take that piece, bring it in. Now you can keep doing this. You can literally do this all day long. But I reckon 12 to 15 turns, something like that. Tighten out really nice into a ball like that, okay? Now it's much firmer to what it was now, it's much more springy. I'm gonna give it a little dust like this, nothing major. Pop my cloth back onto the top. And I'm gonna give it about five minutes to rest up now. Five to 10 minutes I reckon, rest up really nice. Let it relax a little touch, ready for the next shaping stage. 
So 10 minutes has passed and my dough's relaxed nicely, ready for the final shape. A little bit of dust of flour on top like that. Pick it up. Upside down, that's the table, sticky side up. A little press again, I'm just going to press it out into a bit of a circle. And I'm going to do one in a tin. So, not wider than a tin, you want to make it about as wide as what the tin is. Next thing to do, two little flaps like this and fold them in. I'm making the top narrower than the base. Give it a little press down. Take the top flap, push it down like this. Next thing, I'm going to roll it up, building tension as I go. So I'm going to put my, th my thumbs like this in a horizontal line, yeah? Push here, where the seam is. Roll, push, roll, push. Each time, building tension here. Roll, push. When I get to the edge, I'm going to squeeze it up, squeeze up that seam into the table, nice and tight. Roll it over so the seam's back underneath, and that's my loaf made. Now because I rolled it up so nicely, all the tension's going across the top this way. So when it rises up, it'll become nice and tall and proud. Give it a little dust like this, all over. Dust is the only thing that's going to stop it sticking from the tin. So make sure you get dust everywhere, even on the ends, all over the place. Pop it into your tin like this. Now, give it a little shimmy. You may notice that the corners aren't filled, here and here. There are gaps at the corners, because our loaf's not a complete rectangle, which is fine. Resist the urge to push it around everywhere and try and fill those gaps in. Because you're only going to disturb the structure that you've sort of already made. Um, just leave it in there. As it rises up, it's going to fill those gaps on its own naturally as it puffs up. And um, let it rest, ready for the final bake. And that is how you shape a loaf of bread. I hope you'd enjoyed watching this. If you're making a loaf at home, send me a photograph. It's always really nice to have your pictures uh, pop up in my inbox. If it's a great success, let me know. And if it's a complete disaster, let me know too and we'll get on top of it. Um, if you like this video, click like, click subscribe and you won't miss a thing. One video a week, one of your questions answered. Pop it into the comments box underneath and I'll get on top of it. I'll see you next week. Hello, that's Jack here at Bake with Jack answering your bread making questions. Next week I'm going to show you how to knead bread dough. But this week, probably more importantly, I'm going to tell you about why we do it in the first place. So yeast makes the bubbles in the dough. I spoke about that a couple of videos ago on yeast. If you didn't see it, check it out. Um, yeast makes bubbles. Gluten is inside of the flour, and gluten inside of the dough gives our dough the ability to hold all the gas produced by the yeast. So people talk about gluten as if they are elastic bands. Hundreds and thousands of elastic bands inside of our dough knitting the whole thing together. Now at the beginning of our dough, all those elastic bands are really short and really tight. And with a little bit of physical work, which is our kneading, the elastic bands become longer and more stretchier and stronger, giving our dough that strength. Okay? So when the yeast makes those bubbles, hundreds of thousands of bubbles inside, all the outside of the bubbles, the skin of those bubbles, which is our dough, is nice and strong, allowing those bubbles to get nice and big, and our dough to get nicely aerated and puffy, making our dough, uh, our bread, nice and light. If we didn't need the dough, or we didn't give it enough work, um, the structure is going to be too weak. Yeast is going to start making bubbles, but the structure will be too weak to hold it, so it might collapse, or it'll most definitely collapse too soon before it's reached that point of aeration that we want, um, to be really nice bread. Um, it's a little bit like when you puff up a balloon. Give it a good old stretch before you puff it out and it gets bigger. And uh, if you don't do that at home, what are you doing? Just give it a stretch, puff it up, balloon gets much bigger. The moral of the story is, put the work in. It's so much better uh, if you do. It doesn't take long. Just put some music on, hang out, chill out, work your dough nicely. In a nice, rhythm that you're happy with and uh, that you're comfortable with and your dough your bread will thank you for it after thank you so much for watching this next week i'm going to show you how i like to knead the dough and develop that gluten really nicely if you like this video please click like if you've got a question of your own pop it underneath what are you waiting for and if you don't want to miss it next week click subscribe and you won't miss a thing thank you very much i'll see you Next week.
Seriously. Thank you for watching my video. I Hello there, it's Jack here at Bake with Jack answering your bread making questions. Last week I spoke about why we need dough in the first place and this week I'm going to show you how I like to do it. If you missed last week's video you can find it here and my doughs are ready to go. I've mixed the wet and the dry ingredients and it's ready for the next stage which is kneading. Let's go. Okay, my dough's mixed up. It's a little bit of a mess at this point which is normal, don't worry. Pop your scraper there because you're going to need it. Pop your watch off because you might lose it, and this is how I knead the dough. I use the heel of my hand, this one here, to push the dough up across the table like this, and then lift it, put it on the top. Push, lift on the top. So all my hand is doing essentially is a great big circle, right? Push forwards, up and back, like this. It's gonna stick like crazy to the table, and this is okay. Most important thing is, don't toss flour everywhere. That's the last thing you wanna be doing. Keep it sticky like this, absolutely fine. Keep your scraper handy and just use your scraper to clean everything up every once in a while and continue. This is all we do. Easy peasy. No flour. Continue kneading your dough at this style, at this pace, for a good 10 to 12 minutes. And the best way to measure that time is to set a timer. Stick a timer on, turn it to face the other way so you're not watching it, and keep going for a good 10 to 12 minutes. Now, at, a bit, at about six minutes, you're going to start feeling the changes. And that's another reason why it's such a good idea to put timer on. Because at six minutes, everyone's thinking, oh yeah, I'm nearly there now, I'm nearly ready, when actually you've got quite a long way to go. Stick a timer on 10 to 12 minutes and just wait till the time's up. Don't expect it to become all of a sudden non-stick. It may or may not, depending on the flour, depending on the water content in the recipe, there's too many factors. Don't expect it to come non-stick at the end. Just keep going right to the end, 10 to 12 minutes, 15 if you need it, and um, that's it. Take it at a nice pace that you're comfortable with. You don't have to go crackers like Paul Hollywood does. You really don't, just take it at a nice pace. 10 to 12 minutes realistically is quite a long time, and by the end of it, you should get some bounce in your dough, some elasticity, some strength, and it should uh, feel really nice, smooth and lovely. Although it may not be non-stick, it'll be nice and have a smoothness and a structure to it. So good luck with your kneading. I hope this video has helped you out. If you liked it, please click like. If you want to subscribe, click subscribe and you won't miss a thing. If you have a question of your own, stick it in the box underneath and I'll get round to answering it soon. And all the best with your baking and I'll see you all soon. Oops. <laughs> Okay, a question I get asked all the time is where should I leave my dough when it needs to rest? Now, do not go and find a heat source, okay? Don't snuggle it in all cozy into the airing cupboard. Don't stick on top of the oven, next to the auger, next to the radiator. Don't go and find a heat source, you don't need to keep it warm. That is a massive mistake. If you make your dough, follow my instructions, water at room temperature, dough at room temperature, hard work, kneading at room temperature, leave it to rest at room temperature. If you change the environment, if you take it somewhere cold to somewhere warm, or from somewhere warm to somewhere cold, if you change the environment, you're just making issues for yourself. If you've got a heat source coming here, and not here, it's gonna puff up like this. Because of warmth, we're really excited that yeast, and it's gonna puff up unevenly. It doesn't matter about the speed, it matters about the unevenness, the inconsistency of the puff inside of the dose, what you wanna avoid. Just leave it on the side of room temperature, and everything will be fine. If you're worried, avoid breezes. Don't stick it next to an open window. Don't put it next to somewhere warm. And if you are worried, put it in the kitchen cupboard. Stick it in the kitchen cupboard. Close your door. Go and sit down and have a cup of tea. Relax for 60, 90 minutes. In my experience, I've been teaching people to bake in their homes for three and a half years, right? Never have a problem at room temperature. If it's 20 degrees, 23 degrees, 16 degrees, 14 degrees in one house, it's gonna change the speed that it puffs up, but the most easiest, foolproof way to do it, make everything room temperature, 
leave it at room temperature with a cloth on top. Zero issues. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it's helped you out. And if you have a question, stick it in the box underneath. Um, if you liked it, please click like, click subscribe, and you won't miss a single thing. And I will see you next time for another bread making Q&A. See you then. Hello, that's Jack here at Bake with Jack HQ answering bread making questions. And here's a good one. Why hasn't my dough puffed up? <laughs> okay, if your room is between 14 and 21 degrees, even if it's maybe a bit less than 14, even if it's even if it's less than 14, right, and you left the dough for an hour, 90 minutes, something will have happened inside of the bowl. It would have puffed up. If nothing has happened, and I'm talking about zero, if it is exactly the same as what it was when you put it into the bowl, there's only one thing wrong with it, which is your yeast was no good in the first place. Your yeast was too old. If you've got a dry one, it might have been too open for too long. If you've got a fresh one, it's just too old. It's just had it, it's just gone. Um, that's the only reason why they would be zero puff. And uh, if that happens, just make lots of little tiny balls, let them relax for a bit, roll them out wealthy, and make tortilla wraps. Loads of tortilla wraps, because you only need a little tiny bit of dough. If that happens, that's the only thing you can do. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video and it's helped you out on your quest for better bread at home. Um, if you liked it, please click like. Click subscribe and you won't miss a thing. And I will look forward to seeing you next week for another question. If you have a question, stick it here underneath. Pop it in the box under here. Pop it in the comments and I'll get onto it soon. And I look forward to seeing you next week. See ya! Hello there, it's Jack here in the Bakery Jack office. And this week I want to talk to you about something that holds a lot of people back from making bread and a lot of things in life. Fear, don't be afraid. Um, don't be afraid of it because with little bits of knowledge, little bits of understanding, which I share with you on here on a weekly basis, you can turn any disaster into a success. And hopefully you won't have the disaster in the first place. And to give you an example of what I'm talking about, I do a lot of demonstrations and I did one at the weekend at Sandown Park Food Festival. Now I had a lot of dough left over and um, it sits in the car, it sits on my stool, it sits in the demo stage in there all day long and I made this out of it this morning which is rather lovely. Practicing my plats, thanks to the great British Bake Off, practicing my plats, okay? So don't be afraid of it. Have a look at my videos on here, don't be afraid. I've got quite a few videos now and I'm building, 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 always putting one on every week, every Thursday. Um, and I share this stuff all over the place at demonstrations that I do, at classes that I host, when I meet people in their homes. I share this stuff all the time just to build your confidence. Um, because once you start fearing things, you start thinking, is this dough too wet? Is it too sticky? Is it too dry? Is it supposed to look like this? Don't worry, just go with it, relax yourself. Because dough's going to be different all the time. Some recipe might be really sticky, the other recipe might be really dry, but go with it. Don't worry about it. Use your knowledge about what the gluten is doing and the flour and what the yeast does and how to keep it happy. And use all these little bits and bobs um, to make yourself at ease, to put yourself at ease with it and just trust in the dough. A lot of chefs don't make bread. And I think it's because bread is its own entity. It's got its own agenda it does its own thing and you've got to go with it to a certain extent um, so just enjoy the process and relax building confidence is a massive part of what i do when i host a class and i've got some classes coming up in the next two months i'm only doing four so if you'd like some details i'll pop a link down here somewhere underneath or somewhere here and you can come and join me uh, in a class i'm in surrey uh, come and find me and see what's going on and I always get reports of people leaving feeling, okay, I've, I've got this now, I've got this down, go home and make something. They send me pictures of all sorts of stuff that they made I've, and I had really, really good results. Um, have a look at my website, there's testimonials on there and I'll put a link here for my classes if you'd like to come along. Please do come along and smash that fear to pieces. I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much for watching my video and yeah, I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon.
Hello there, it's me here, it's Jack at Bakery Jack headquarters. And sorry I've been away for a while. Um, some stuff happened. I've been on the uh, demonstration tour, touring food festivals all over the place. Uh, and I'm back now. So today's tip is going to be a quick one. Uh, it's going to be pretty obvious when you hear it, but actually it's super helpful, I think. And here it is. Double check your ingredients. If you want to rule out error, double check your ingredients, your quantities, weighing stuff out, double, double check it. It sounds obvious, but what happens a lot of the time when you get down the line, if you're rushing a recipe, you haven't checked it properly and you're halfway through and you're thinking, is my dough too wet? Did I put this in it? Is it too dry? Did I, did I by accident measure it wrong? This can be ruled out if you just double check it. Have a look at your ingredients. Have a look at what you're weighing on the screen, on your scales or whatever. Double check those two numbers. Make sure that you're the, they're the same. And then move on to the next ingredient. It sounds so obvious, um, but if you get in the habit of doing it, you know, it translates to bread making, pastry making, whatever you're making in the kitchen, whatever you're doing. Double check everything. Rule out doubt, rule out error, and proceed with confidence. <laughs> Just a quick one today. I hope it's helpful and I see you soon. If you like the video, just click the little thumbs up down below. That would be amazing if you did that. And if you want to subscribe, I put on a bread tip or baking tip once a week on a Thursday, uh, apart from last week because I was very busy. But I'm back in the game now and I will see you next week. Hello, it's Jack here broadcasting your weekly uh, bread tip at Bake with Jack in the hub of the production kitchen, <laughs> my house. Um, I want to talk to you about sugar today. Somebody sent me an email, a nice email, asking me about honey and sugar and why there's no honey and sugar in my bread recipe. Um, people put honey and sugar in recipes, something sweet for a few reasons. One being, it's a sweet recipe, it's an enriched dough, it's something sweet, it's a hot cross bun for example. You need the sugar or the honey or whatever it is uh, for sweetness. Uh, reason number two is it helps it stuff brown off a little bit more, uh, a little bit quicker. The sugar caramelizes and the loaf takes on a nice brown color. Um, if you want to add it for that reason, absolutely fine. Just a little touch will be enough. Not enough to sweeten it, but enough to take on a nice colour. And the third reason is uh, a lot of old school recipes say stuff like mix your yeast with some sugar and water or milk and sugar or a bit of honey or something to really give it a kick start, let it froth up and get it going. But uh, in my mind, that's a little bit unnecessary. Uh, I just use fresh yeast and stick it into the water till it's soft or dry yeast straight into the flour. Um, the whole thing of adding sugar and letting it foam up, I think, in my mind, is probably uh, a bit of a safety measure because, you know, if you've got some fresh yeast and you wanna make sure it's active, you're writing a recipe for somebody, I've gotta make sure that it's gonna work for you. And so I think when people put sugar in it, let it froth up in the jug, I think that's a safety measure because if you put sugar in it and it didn't froth up in the jug, you know something is wrong and you know you've got to start again with some fresh yeast. And that's why I think it's there. I think it's just there for that safety measure. Um, but I never do it. I use fresh yeast, I know it's fresh. I use dry yeast, I know it's dry. <laughs> it's in a packet and it's not too old. Um, so uh, I don't do that bit. I'll just skip it. There's no need for it really, as long as you know your yeast is okay. And that's the bread tip for this week. Another quick one. Last week was a quick one and today is a quick one too. And uh, I'm going to share some cool Halloween stuff next week, I think, um, or the following week. And I'm looking forward to it. If you like this video, please click like underneath if you like it, if you like to. That's absolutely fine. I don't mind that at all. And uh, subscribe if you want to see my videos once a week and you don't want to miss a single thing please click subscribe. I'll be here next week and I look forward to seeing you then. See you later. Hello, there's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk sharing your weekly bread tip 
every single Thursday, and this week is a quick one again. Three quick ones in a row, you probably appreciate that a little bit, I'd imagine. Um, this week, when I make bread, it's all about ruling out error. I do everything to rule out error. I talk about temperature to rule out error, where you rest it to rule out error, everything to rule out error, because error, at the end of the day, after you've done everything, after you spent so long kneading and resting and shaping and resting again, error is the worst thing in the world. If something goes wrong, it's really upsetting after all that time, and the worst thing that can happen, worse than it going wrong, is it's gone wrong and you don't know why it went wrong. That's the worst thing. If it goes wrong and you're, full, you're, you're fully aware of what happened, why it happened, and you take responsibility for that, it's absolutely not a problem. But if you don't know why it went wrong all that time and effort seems like it's a little bit wasted and you're still clueless. So here's your tip this week. It is keep yourself a baking diary. This is my baking diary. If you're really into this and you wanna get better or you just wanna get good, just write down everything inside a book like this. Get a recipe, write everything down. Exactly what you've done on the day, exactly what the temperature's like, exactly what the results were, so you can look at it and go, heavy loaf, don't do that again. Or you can like figure out what the difference was between last time and this time you've done it. And the most, best bit of advice I can give you with a baking diary is to write everything down even if you think it's irrelevant. Just pop it down, because otherwise you might want that little bit of information next time. Like what temperature the room was, or if it was a particularly sunny day. Stuff like that all affects your bread. And if you got it in black and white on paper, you know you can look back at it and you can learn from it. And when somebody answers some question, maybe it's me, it answers a question of yours and you think, oh, maybe I did that wrong, have a little peek. Oh yeah, fluffed that up last time, and that's why it was a failure. Keep all your books. I've got another one here. This one's old school. This one's properly old school. It's got loads of old stuff in it. Look at the state of it. It's wicked. I love it. Keep a baking diary. Keep a log of your successes and your failures and switch it up for next time. My name is Jack and I'll bring you a tip every single week. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. I'm not talking to myself. Thank you so much for watching. Please click subscribe if you don't want to miss anything else and um, click like if you liked it. I'll be back here next week with another one to get to the bottom of your baking disasters or to take you to new heights, baking success. Come and check me out on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook if you like. If you're on those things, look up Bake With Jack. I'm on there, have a chat with me and send me your questions too and I'll get on top of it. Thank you so much, take care, see you next week. Hello there, it's Jack here bringing your bread making tip this week, every single Thursday from bakewithjack.co.uk and today I'm out in the Bake With Jack mobile <laughs> on location because I'm a busy boy. I thought I'd do it in my car. Here we are, I've just, uh, I'm in, um, I am in Godalming in Surrey and I've just finished baking bread with two lovely ladies at the house. We did an introduction to homemade bread. We made some lovely bread loaves in tins. We made some walnut loaf, some rolls and a nice meal to go with it too that they are no doubt enjoying right now this minute. Um, I want to talk to you this week about seeds. I had a question from Gaynor on the blog. Thank you very much Gaynor. Um, I had a question about seeds. Um, when to put them in your dough, when to put them on your dough, how to stop them from burning, and how to stop them from falling off. And uh, here we go, are you ready? There are two points where you can put seeds in your dough, depending on where you want them. If you want them on the top or you want them inside. If you want them inside of your bread, uh, best thing to do is make your dough, do your kneading, right at the end of the kneading, or when you've even finished your kneading, spread it out across the table, nice and wide and flat, Put all your seeds on the top and then roll them inside and continue kneading until it's nice and evenly dispersed uh, throughout the dough. And then you can carry on with the next stages. Um, the second time you can put it, if you want it on the top of the dough, the best thing to do there is make your dough, do the kneading, do the resting, do the knockback, do the shape, and that is when you put the seeds on the top. After the shaping, before the final proof, before baking, after the shaping point, put your seeds on it. Get yourself one of those squirty water gun uh, things, like a mister. I've got one here, but I can't reach it. Get yourself a squirty water mister, and then 
spray all over the top of your dough, uh, whether it's rolls or loaf or whatever, then you can either dip it into your seeds, if you've got seeds in a plastic box like I do, quite like that, or aeroplane, or you can sprinkle them on top uh, of the dough. It's up to you. Um, so, one thing was mentioned was how to stop seeds from burning. Now, if you do it on a small bread, like small little bread roll, I don't think there's an issue with burning there because it's not in the oven for long enough, I don't think. Um, but if you're doing a big loaf, it's gonna be in the oven for a good 40, 45 minutes. And then, so a good idea is if you wanna soak the seeds first, that it should take on some moisture and that moisture will stop it from burning whilst in the oven. I hope this helps with your bread making. I send you a tip every single Thursday right here. Um, if you've got some questions, stick them underneath. Please click like if you liked it. And if you subscribe, you won't miss a single post from me. Next week, I'm going to talk about steam. Um, and I look forward to seeing you then. I'm going home now. See you later. Hello, that's Jack here bringing your weekly bread making tip at bakewithjack.co.uk every single Thursday and today I want to talk to you about steam. Uh, I was sent a question from Dan on Facebook, thank you very much Dan, about uh, what steam does and why we use steam in the oven when we're baking. Um, and let me tell you why and then I'll tell you the best way I find of making it happen. So let me tell you what happens when your bread bakes. If you've got a loaf and you pop it into the oven in the heat, it's gonna puff up a little touch like this, right? That's called oven spring, okay? When it puffs up like that in the heat, that's called oven spring. Then what happens is that the outside of the dough sets, like the crust forms on the outside, and the oven spring stops at that point, and then it continues to bake. Now, when you, put steam into the oven, it creates a humid environment so that when that loaf goes in, it's able then to expand for longer since the steam uh, delays that crust from forming. So it can continue to expand a little bit more, becoming bigger and more lighter and more aerated. Another thing is that that really crusty crust that you're trying to produce out of your oven at home is achievable by steam. That's the only way. Every single bread comes out of the oven crusty. That's the rules. It just comes out crusty, every single one, with or without steam. However, as you let it rest on the cooling rack, let it cool down, all that humidity evens out inside, and the crust often uh, softens up again and becomes chewy again, and you lose that crispy crunchiness. Now, with the steam, that makes a crust that stays. And here's what happens in my mind. What happens is, in that humid environment, um, you are able to bake your loaf for on a higher heat for longer um, because the steam will stop it from burning. And that high heat on the outside of the dough, on the outside of the bread, will create a real nice crusty crust that won't go away. In the past, I've done a massive loaf in my oven um, for like a dough that I've come back from a demonstration with loads of dough left. I'll just make up a big loaf stick on the top shelf, loads and loads of steam, and I've quite happily baked it. Maximum temperature in my oven, which is about 230 degrees, um, for 40, 45 minutes without it burning, and that's thanks to the steam wicked crust. Um, there's another thing that I read the other day in this book, Slow Dough Real Bread, got sent to me the other day. I'm really pleased with it, and it says this. Steam turns the outer surface of the dough into a flexible gel which allows it to expand more easily uh, in the oven than if a dry crust starts forming straight away. Fine. Later in the dry heat stage of baking, the gel starts to set to form a shiny, and in some cases, crackly crust. So, if you're in a baker's and you see a real nice shine on the top of a loaf, real crackly thick crust, that's thanks to the steam, because that steam condenses on the outside, creating that nice flexible gel uh, in that book, that what that book says, uh, and that bakes on the top, making it nice and crusty, which does make sense in my mind. Um, so, there's a few ways of getting steam into your oven, and I wanna take to talk, I'm just gonna tell you about my most successful way of doing it. Everyone's oven's different, and every time I go to somebody's house, their oven's completely different. Sometimes they've got a vent coming out the back allowing the steam to escape. Sometimes there's a vent in the front allowing the steam to escape. Sometimes it keeps the steam in really well. 
And in a household oven, you know, it's probably designed in a way um, to stop that steam from hitting you in the face when you open the door, and that's probably why it ejects the steam from somewhere, I'd imagine. Um, but it's a bit tricky to get the same results in everyone's oven, but there are ways to do it, okay? Um, what I do is this. I have the top shelf, in fact, I have the top shelf about in the middle way down of the oven. Then, on the bottom of the oven, on the very floor of the oven, I put a deep roasting tray. The roasting tray stays in the oven all the time, it just lives there. Every time I preheat the oven, the tray's preheating itself. And when my dough's ready to go, I pop the kettle on, a kettle of water. Fill it up halfway, whatever, click it on. Dough's ready to go. Wait for it to click off, boiled water. Put the dough into the oven, take your jug to the oven, pull out your deep tray on the bottom shelf with some uh, oven gloves, pour the water in, about one centimetre, two centimetres, all go all steam up everywhere, shut the door, close it in there, contain the steam inside the oven, and uh, that should be enough to get a real nice crispy crust. Sometimes if I've got space, if I'm just using that one shelf for baking bread, I've got another shelf underneath it, and a tray underneath that shelf on the floor of the oven. If I'm just using the top shelf for baking bread like a big loaf, double up those two trays. Get another tray in there, the same, two roasting trays underneath your shelf where you're baking on, and double up that steam, really create loads and loads of steam. Because uh, you can't do too much, I don't think. Um, create loads of steam and then get a real crusty crust, and that's when I baked that loaf that time, 45 minutes on 230 without it burning, real nice crispy crust. And if you properly nail it, if you properly nail it, loaf comes out of the oven, get onto your cooling rack, turn your telly off, turn your radio off, make it nice and quiet, and sit and listen to your loaf singing, because it will crack and it will snap, crackle and pop while it's sitting and resting and cooling on your cooling rack. And that's when you know that you've nailed that proper crust. And then sit back and enjoy your bread. Let it cool down first, of course, and then uh, eat it all. Eat it all up, that's what I do. Um, so if you struggle with that, if it still doesn't make a nice crust, there's another thing you can do. Allow your loaf to cool down. Allow it to cool down completely. Put the oven back on 200 degrees. Get your squirty gun. Uh, I talked about squirting again before, I think, like a mister with water in it. Take your loaf, spray it all over nice and wet, pop it back in the oven for 12-15 minutes, and that should create the crispy crust that does not go away. I hope this has helped you make bread. I hope this has helped you create that nice crispy crust that everybody is after in your own oven at home. Good luck with it. Let me know if you have success with it. Please let me know. If you like this, please click like. And if you don't want to miss a single one of my videos, uh, click the subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. It's much appreciated that you come and hang out with me every single week on here and listen to me uh, talk about bread and baking because I love it. And I look forward to seeing you next week. If you've got a question, send it on to me. I look forward to answering it soon. Take care. See ya. Hello there, it's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. This week I want to share with you my top two ways uh, to improve uh, your bread in terms of flavour, in terms of texture, in terms of shape. I've got two ways uh, to improve it and it's super easy. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay, the way to improve your bread number one. This is the easiest way, right? As your dough is resting in the bowl, at the resting stage, after you've mixed it, after you've kneaded it, you've let it rest in the bowl. At that stage, if you can prolong that resting time for as long as possible, your bread is gonna get better and better and better in terms of flavor and texture, because flavor develops and gluten develops even further after your hard work just by sitting in the bowl in the moisture for free. Yes, all you gotta do is nothing. Okay, so take your bowl of dough after you've kneaded it, wrap it up in cling film, stick it in your fridge and leave it there for 24 hours, 48 hours. I've had one in the fridge for six days before and it's been absolutely delicious when it came out. 
bring it out after that time has passed, leave it on the side at room temperature for an hour, an hour and a half, let it come back, let it come back alive. It never comes right back the way to room temperature, but it will warm up a little touch. Then shape it, then rest it, and then bake it. The second resting bit will take a little bit longer. One, because the dough is cold, and two, depending on how long you left it in the fridge for, um, it depends on how active the yeast now is. So keep your eyes peeled at that moment. After 24 hours, shouldn't take much longer anyway, really. Keep your eyes peeled, it's gonna rise up nice and slow, and when you bake it, it's gonna be absolutely wonderful. Okay, tip number two, and this is for you regular bread bakers if you're making bread once, twice a week or whatever. This is a simple way that I used to use. Uh, the first time I'll bake bread in a restaurant actually, I used to regularly bake bread in a restaurant early morning. Early morning I used to use this tip to make everything better every single time and this is how it goes. Every time you make a batch of bread, take a little piece of dough off your big dough mass. Take a piece of dough away, 100, 200 grams or whatever, and stick it in the fridge. Leave it there. Let it get old, okay? Give it a couple of days until your next bake or whenever that is. It might be four or five days away, six days away. Leave it in the fridge until next time. Make your new dough at that point and add the other bit in. Add it in. When you're putting the water in, the yeast in and all that stuff, when you're mixing it all together at the mixing stage, add that piece of old dough in. It will bring loads of flavour, loads of texture, loads of structure and loads of good stuff to your bread dough. Then, at that point, let your dough rest take it out of the bowl, divide it up into what you're gonna make and take another piece, take a piece at that point, 100, 200 grams, whatever, stick it in the fridge. Every single time you do bread, add that old piece, mix it up, take an old piece, put it in the fridge, add that old piece, mix it up, take an old piece, put it in the fridge, keep going and going and going and every single batch of bread that you make is gonna be more delicious, it's gonna hold a real nice shape, it's gonna have a real nice uh, feel to the dough, silky, smooth, nice, bounce is going to hold more and more air, it's going to have a real tasty flavour and it's going to increase, it's going to make it way more delicious, way more delicious every single time. It's so easy, just take a piece, stick it in the fridge. If you're a regular baker, that is the best thing to do. Thank you so much for watching. Have a little go on these two tips and let me know how you get on. I'd love to hear how you get on with it and how much it improves your bread. Um, thank you so much. If you want to click like, please click like. Thanks for joining me every single Thursday for a bread making tip. If you got a question, stick it underneath. Put it here somewhere. Let me hear about it. Come and connect with me on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Send me your question. Send me a question and I'll get on top of it next week. Every Thursday I'm here. I look forward to seeing you next week. Hello, there's Jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk. I'm really excited about this week's bread making tip and I'll tell you why. It's how to shape a food gas and it comes straight from my food gas making kit. It's a little snippet from the tip videos you'll receive uh, when you register your kit online it's here it is it's what it looks like bake a food gas kit uh, with online course and it comes with all the ingredients to make two rather lovely herby food gases food herby food guy herby food gases comes with a rather lovely bake with jack dough scraper yes and it comes with <coughs> this proving cloth can you see that lovely bake with jack proving cloth all the ingredients inside the box as well for you to make your nice food gas. Uh, here's the clip for the week. I'm going to stick a link on here somewhere if you want to pick one up. Pick one up from the website and enjoy the video. Okay, so by now your dough should be puffed up nice and ready. Take the cloth off the top and you should have a nice puffed up dough. Nice and soft and aerated. If it's not puffed up quite that much, you can leave it for a bit longer if you like. Put that to one side. I've got a couple of things here to help me. I've got a little pot of flour with my scraper inside, ready to go. And I've got two trays. I've just lined two trays of some parchment paper. They're ready to go too. So first things first, take your cloth off. And we're gonna get the dough out of the bowl now onto some flour. So toss some flour down. You can be quite generous with this one because it's not gonna be any folds, it's not gonna be any turns or anything. Be quite generous with the flour, it won't make too much difference. Loosen up your dough around the edge of the bowl like this. Loosen it up, 
We're gonna take it out, see those bubbles coming? Yes! We're gonna take it out, upside down, onto the flour, and just ease it out of the bowl with a scraper. Ease it out because we wanna keep some of that aeration. Now, love this bit. A little bit of flour on the top now. You can smell those herbs. Have a smell, I can smell those herbs. Push it like this, just to make it slightly flattened all over. Just with your fingertips, push down. Don't push away, because if you push away, stuff like this happens, it pings back. And also you get like, you can put holes in it, you get like real weak spots, real flat bits. So just push down like this, all the way over like this, right? We're gonna make two food gases with this one, so. You should have a round circle, just check underneath. Check all the time, it doesn't stick, just have a check. Nice round circle. Now, take your scrape, we're gonna use this side to cut. Push down and peel away. Push right down to the table. Push, peel away. Two halves, lovely. Put one to the side. Right, so we've got this one. I'm gonna try and make it into a sort of a leaf shape. I'm not gonna do anything major to it, just give it a little push around like this. Press down like that, nice and gently. Bit more flour. Now you can make some cuts. This one we're going to keep quite simple. Um, the key point here is just to sort of be creative, and you can do whatever you like. This is the thing with it. You can do whatever you like, make some cuts. But the points are: try not to join your cuts up because you're at risk of making a great big hole, and try not to go over the edge because you're at risk of making a great big hole. So this is the sort of semi-traditional one, I suppose. Two cuts down the middle. Open them up nicely. Use the shorter side for a shorter cut. I'm going to go down the edge like this. Two, three, four, five looks nice. One, two, three, four, five. Right the way through to the table. Open them up, stretch them up like this, real nice and big and wide. Really nice. Pop it onto your tray. Open up those holes nice and big because as the dough bakes, it's going to puff up and all those holes are, holes are going to want to close themselves up. One done, lovely. Now for the next one, same thing, I'm just going to work with the natural shape, give it a push around, make it a bit leaf shape if I can. This time, I'm going to put a great big hole down the middle. Slightly shorter to the side, both sides. Slightly shorter to the side of that one. And then with a the short side, a little small one. Open them up nice, yes. Then you can sort of nick little, uh, little spikies around the edge if you like, that's quite a nice thing to do. Make it look a bit attractive. And then be brave, pop them onto the tray. Have a little rearrange. Yes, food gas number two, nice one. Thank you so much for watching my video. It's much appreciated that you join me here every Thursday for a bread making tip. Um, one more plug, if you wanna pick up the food gas kit, you can find it. I'm gonna put a link underneath, you can find it on my website and um thank you very much if you want to click like please click like and if you like to subscribe you won't miss a single thing i will see you next week it's me it's jack here at bakewithjack.co.uk bringing your weekly bread making tip every single thursday and i feel so strongly to share this with you today uh, that I've had to do it now. It's not even daytime. It's night time. I've got the lights on. That's why it's a little bit ropey in here. My hair's a little bit of a mess, but here goes, right? I tell people this in every single one of my classes, and if you're a home baker and you get inconsistent results or it doesn't quite work and you give up or something goes wrong somewhere down the line, it can be down to this. It can be down to temperature, right? 
And the reason I feel so strongly about this is because most bread making books say things like measure out so many milliliters of lukewarm water or tepid water or body heat water or warm water or hand hot water and nobody knows what these words means only the person who wrote it down in the book. And maybe they don't even know because I don't even know and I'm not here to decipher this stuff because I don't even know, not even I know this stuff. However, what I will tell you is temperature is so important. If your yeast is making bubbles inside of your dough making it rise, um, you need to keep it happy. And if it's really, really warm, it makes bubbles really, really fast. And if it's really, really cold, it makes bubbles really, really slowly. It still makes bubbles, but it makes it really, really slowly. So this is why it's quite important to know what the temperature is of everything. Because if you're using hand hot, body heat, tepid water, whatever it is, you don't know what that is and you don't know what to expect out of your dough. Okay. So I use room temperature water when I make bread. Room temperature, and I've been going to people's houses now for three and a half years, baking bread with them in their kitchens, and it's normally between 18 and 23 degrees. Somewhere between there, sometimes 17, sometimes 16, and that's okay, but the point is, I have this to tell me what temperature the room is, and I have this to tell me what temperature the water is, and I make the water room temperature, which means match the two numbers together. If the room's 20, use 20 water. If the room's 18, use 18 water. The point is, your dough's gonna spend a lot of time in that room. It's gonna prove up, it's gonna rest. You're gonna leave it there for a couple of hours, minimum, before it goes into the oven, right? And over all that time, it's gonna level out there or thereabouts and become um, the temperature of the room, right? As long as you leave it in the room, which I'll speak about in another video, when it's proven leave it at room temperature. If everything is room temperature and you're leaving it at room temperature all the way until it goes into the oven, the rest of the stuff surrounding it is easy peasy. Problems come if you've got a warm dough in a cool place or a cool dough in a warm place. This is where you get some issues and you read stuff in books like oil some cling film and put it on top to stop it from sticking or wet some paper, wet some cloth and put it on the top and put your dough in the air and cupboard and stuff like this and it's all crackers, all you need to do is match these two numbers, prove it out on the side in the kitchen and everything will be fine. You're gonna sidestep a lot of potential issues that come from making a warm dough. Seriously, trust me, make it at room temperature, leave it at room temperature, as long as your room's like between 18 and 23, even 17 and 16, it's gonna be cool, it's gonna be fine. Don't worry too much about it. Nobody talks about this stuff and I don't know why. I don't understand why nobody talks about temperature. It might make the beginning a little bit more complicated, not by much, but it makes the whole process down the line much more simpler. The less that you do, the better the bread's gonna be. Thank you so much for joining me every single Thursday for my weekly bread making tip. There is so much to talk about and if you've got a question as well, ask me that's what i'm here for okay you can tweet me you can instagram me you can facebook me you can leave a comment here ask me a question and i'll get round to it in time um please click like if you liked it and if you want to subscribe you won't miss a single thing okay i will see you next week i look forward to it one more thing before i go i remembered a story from a lady okay i visited a lady in her house and she'd been trying to make bread for a long time and it's been consistently inconsistent even though she had an oven with a proving program and a baking program you just got to make the dough and put it in and it takes care of the rest for you okay even though that was the case and it came with a book of specific recipes specifically for the oven to take all the work out to make a ciabatta or a baguette or a bloomer or anything you wanted in the world it will produce as long as you follow the instructions put it in the oven let it prove it on its own let it bake it on its own however However, the results were always inconsistent and always uh, not good enough. And the first thing I asked when I arrived, the first thing that I asked was what temperature is it when it goes in? Because the oven doesn't know what temperature it is. The oven does this for this amount of time, this for this amount of time, whatever it does, bakes it, whatever, I don't know. But it doesn't know what temperature it goes in at. So if it doesn't know what temperature goes in at, how does it know how long to prove it for? And at what temperature to prove it for? 
It just doesn't know. And that's why that, in theory, that nice oven and the nice book that comes with it is faultless. It's completely faultless. However, it neglected to tell you what temperature you need it to be when it goes in. And so the whole thing is irrelevant and useless and pointless. It makes sense. Check your temperatures. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you next week uh, for another answer to another question. And uh, I'm going to start putting more recipes on next year. I feel like I need to do more recipes. So I'm going to get my head together and put that together for next year. I'm looking forward to it. Anyway, I'll see you next week for another tip. Mm -hmm.